Um, welcome everyone, and thank you all for coming to the first event in this year's Asian Deaf Lecture Series um, for today's talk by Yan Liu um, on Healing with Poisons, the Circulation of Medical Knowledge in Medieval China. Uh, my name is Michelle Wong, and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Georgetown University. Along with my colleague, um, Jim Millward in the Department of History, uh, we have co-organized the Asian Deaf Lecture Series um, since last year. And it's great to see so many familiar and new faces in the audience, both from Georgetown and beyond. Our major sponsor um, is the Asian Studies Program in Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Thanks to Kelly Bio for facilitating the funding of this year's events. Our thanks also to Chris Sealing in the Department of History for handling administrative details and logistics. Our other co-sponsors for today's lecture are the Georgetown Medical Humanities Initiative, the Georgetown Humanities Initiative, and the Global Medieval Studies Program. The format for today's program is that the first hour will be given over to the lecturer and to Q&A. After that, please feel free to stay on for an informal meet and greet with Professor Liu until 6.30. And as I mentioned earlier, the event is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Georgetown History Department's YouTube channel. Um, so please feel free to turn off your camera if you prefer not to be in that video recording. And I'm now going to turn things over to my colleague, Lakshmi Krishnan, who is a historian of medicine, a medical humanities scholar and a physician, as well as the director of the Georgetown Medical Humanities Initiative. And she will now introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Wang. And it's an, it's an honor to be here. We're delighted to be co-sponsoring Professor Liu's talk. So to introduce Professor Liu, um, Yan Liu is an assistant professor in history at SUNY Buffalo. He obtained his PhD in history of science at Harvard University in 2015 and was an Andrew Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the Jackman Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto from 2015 to 2016. He specializes in the history of medicine in medieval China with a focus on pharmacology, religious healing, the history of senses and the global transmission of medical knowledge. His first book, Healing with Poisons, Potent Medicines in Medieval China, was published by the University of Washington Press in June 2021. The book offers a cultural history of poisons as healing agents in the formative age of Chinese pharmacology, highlighting the shifting boundary between medicines and poisons as shaped by technical, political, and religious conditions. His second book project, explores the circulation of aromatics such as saffron, camphor, etc., and olfactory knowledge along the Silk Road from the 7th to the 13th century. Thank you again for joining us, Professor Liu, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much uh, for your very nice uh, introduction, Professor Krishnan. And I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Wang and Professor Mueller for uh, inviting me uh, joining this uh, Asian in-depth series um, and uh, share my, uh, my new book uh, with the audience uh, at Georgetown and beyond. Uh, that's the benefit of using Zoom, right? Um, and I'm very excited to share uh, my book uh, with colleagues in history, Asian studies, in medical humanities, and medieval studies. I know a lot of institutions in Georgetown uh, kindly uh, co-sponsor this exciting event. So thank you all, and thank you all for uh, joining this, uh, this event. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, share my uh, screen uh, with you. Okay. So in today's talk, titled Teething with Poison to Circulation Medical Knowledge in Viva China, uh, the talk is based on the one chapter from uh, uh, my new book uh, titled Healing with Poisons, Potent Medicines in Medieval China. And I hope it could give you a, a window through which to think about uh, the use of poisons in particularly in the political domain in early Tang period and how uh, the handling of poisons and medicine in general allows the state to achieve uh, effective governance, but on the other hand, we also find a fluid transformation of such knowledge in local regions. So I'd like to start uh, with a quote from uh, Sun Smiao. This is a 7th century physician, a famous physician in Chinese medical history. In one of his medical books uh, produced in the late 7th century, uh, he wrote, quote, among the mere things in the world, nothing cannot be a medicine. So according to Sun Smiao, 
There was no essential difference between medicines and non-medicines in the right context. Anything could be a drug. And indeed, Chinese pharmacopoeia was vast, including a variety of substances of mineral, herbal, and animal origins. And strikingly, we find a large number of poisons or potent substances included in uh, Chinese pharmacy. This is perhaps surprising to some of you. Uh, this is one example called Fuzi, uh, Econite, which is highly poisonous throughout this plant. And oftentimes its tubers were harvested and processed for a variety of medicinal usages. Uh, but I can let you know that this plant actually was one of the most frequently prescribed medicines uh, in Chinese pharmacy. And other, uh, to the degree that one fifth century doctor claimed that it is the lord of all medicines. Okay, so um, there are examples uh, in Chinese pharmacy uh, besides plant, uh, such as uh, the mineral drug cinnabar, which is a mercury compound often used in alchemy as well. Realgar, which is a uh, arsen compound, as well as uh, the python skull bladder. Uh, this is in the animal category. And finally, uh, cannabis, which interestingly was placed in the category of food. So we see this variety of poison substances in uh, Chinese medicine. And this is basically uh, the question I asked, right? So uh, this is rather uh, ignored history in Chinese medicine. Why did people in the past use such a large number of toxic substances for healing purposes? And for that, I want to uh, explain a little bit on this uh, important character called Du in Chinese, right? So in the modern context is Du, very similar to its English counterpart uh, word poison, is a very negative word, which invites association with harm, danger, and intrigue. But in the pre-modern context, actually this word carried a variety of different meanings to the degree that my book wouldn't be able to cover. But my book actually focuses on something quite interesting, which is, you know, at least from the Han, if not earlier, that do carry this ambivalent meanings uh, according to a first century dictionary, its core meaning is thickness, which refers to the lofty mountains. Thickness implies um, heaviness, intensity, uh, perhaps un unconstrained growth. It doesn't carry an obvious negative sense. This idea of sickness was well preserved and manifested in the medical context from the Han period on, we find do actually carry a strong meaning of potency, especially in the pharmacological writings. A potent substance, on the one hand, surely it can harm as a poison, but on the other hand, it could also cure as a medicine. And doctors from early on in China were fully aware of uh, the duality of do uh, and do possessing drugs. So instead of avoiding these powerful substances altogether, actually they develop a variety of techniques to transform poisons into medicines, such as doses control, such as combination with some other ingredients and drug processing. Uh, this is the focus of a different chapter in my book to explore these various techniques. So when I, sorry, uh, in the previous slide, when I talk about potent, they can see the, the word potency here as well in the title, subtitle, uh, or poison. Uh, in this context, I want to highlight the duality of the poison medicine, right? The ambivalence of poison medicine uh, in, in my work, rather than treating poison or do as something categorically bad or harmful, right? So that's my perspective. And my book, Healing with Poisons, was published uh, last summer by the Uni University of Washington Press. Uh, with also uh, an open access edition available uh, to the public. It basically explores uh, the history of poisons used as healing agents from the third century to the eighth century, uh, a period of time I consider a formative age of uh, Chinese pharmacological history. And the book contains, contains seven content chapters divided into three parts. It starts with uh, uh, exploration of the paradoxical meaning of do, as I uh, ex explained briefly, and various techniques of transforming poisons into medicines. And then it moved to uh, the implication of using poisons in 
political and social domains. And finally, uh, moving from the use of poisons to kill illness to the enhancement of body, I investigated the strong body sensations induced by some of these poison substances in the use of powerful mineral drugs, as well as in Chinese alchemy. So for today's talk, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I focus on chapter four, which is on state regulation of medicine in early Tang and its repercussions in local regions. Before del uh, delving into the details of, uh, of this chapter, I want to give you a, a brief sense of the history of Chinese medicine in the pre-modern period, which based on uh, some previous scholars' words can be divided into three sub-periods, starting from the Qin and Han period. This is roughly from the third century before the common era to the third century after. Uh, this is a period considered a foundational period for, the, uh, uh, for Chinese medicine. Uh, where we find a collection of medical classics uh, formed during this period. Uh, one example is the Divine Farmer's Classic of Materia Medica, which is a foundational text for uh, pharmac uh, pharmacological writing in China. And then from 10th century on, the Song period on, we see uh, the re-examination uh, and uh, also reconstruction of some of these ancient classics either by the effort of a state or by uh, individuals as scholar officials. And then later on in the Ming Qing period, we see an increasing uh, popularization and marketization of such medical knowledge in society. So both periods of time uh, have been examined extensively by historians of medicine in China previously, but what's in between this 800 years of history has been largely ignored. And my book offers uh, one of uh, the first monograph land studies on uh, medical history during this period of time in China, and with a particular focus on uh, pharmacology, because I do find very uh, important development of pharmacology during this period of time. And if we take a closer look at this period, uh, we can actually divide it in roughly into two halves. Right? So the first half covering the first about 300 years of history. Uh, it's a era of division, right? You can see that, you know, various, uh, the peoples uh, of the Turkic, Mongolian, Tibetan origins, they occupied the Northern part and where a succession of regimes established by the Han people occupied the South, right? Despite this political division or perhaps because of this, uh, we find the flourishing of the medical culture. And we find quite a lot of texts produced in the southeastern region uh, here, including pharmacological texts, including alchemical texts. And importantly, uh, medicine during this period of time was pr pr primarily practiced uh, be, uh, within the uh, aristocratic uh, clans. And such knowledge was transmitted over generations, sometimes over centuries, many generations, right? So this so-called hereditary medicine was very prominent at the time. And the situation changed in the following centuries when the uh, Sui and Tang established a unified empire and moving the political center to the north uh, west, uh, Chang'an as a center. And when we see, especially in the seventh and eighth century, uh, increasing effort of the state uh, to regulate medical practice and producing standardized texts, uh, which is the focus of uh, this talk, and especially uh, this talk focuses on the early Tang period, the 7th century and early 8th century, when such effort was most salient. In terms of the sources I use for this chapter, uh, primarily I can put them into two groups. And one group is medical sources, because this is a book on, on medicine, and the particular use uh, a genre called material medica, or ben cao, uh, in Chinese. And Ben Cao refers to a medical genre that can be traced back to the Han period, uh, manifested by Divine Farmer's classic of Mathieu Medica. It is a genre that includes a large number of drugs, each with its properties, sources of supply, morphology, and above all, medical usages. And uh, this writing of uh, Ben Cao in China actually followed a commentary tradition, uh, which means we start with the Han text, Divine Farmer's Classic, 
And then the later pharmacal uh, material medical writings preserve that you know, core writing in the Han and added layers uh, of commentary to each of the drug entry, making the book like bigger and bigger right, over time. So this is a fifth century commentary, this is a seventh century commentary, and this is a 11th century commentary. And from that time on, from the 11th century on, actually we do have the complete extend copy of the text uh, to study, which preserve these all earlier layers of the text, allowing modern scholars to recover the earlier uh, materialica sources. And over time, we can also see not just expansion of each drug entry, also the increase of uh, number of drugs over time. Uh, adding new drugs there. And so my key point here is that this commentary tradition actually uh, reflects uh, a certain respect for the textual authority starting from the ancient period time, right? They basically copy these previous writings, adding commentaries uh, to the end of each drug entry. This is one example uh, from the last text shown in the previous slide, the Song text, verified and classified material medica. Li Ben Cao. Uh, this entry actually is on Econite, the highly poisonous herb. You see the illustration and you see the text on the right. You can see there's different kind of writing here in terms of the size of the text, in terms of the color of the text. And you can see uh, this layer here is basically a copy from the original Divine Farmers classic Yun Han. Uh, written in the large character with the black background highlighting its importance. And then a commentary added by the fifth century figure is preserved here. Another commentary added by the Song uh, author uh, is shown here, right? And see this layers, a layer of commentary. Besides uh, Matthew Malika, I also use Dun Huang a manuscript uh, from uh, dating to the fifth to the 11th century. And so, as many of you know, Dunhuang is a site in uh, the modern day Gansu province in the northeastern China. And uh, back in uh, this period of time, it was a flourishing town uh, on the crossroads of the Silk Road. A large collection of manuscripts, prim uh, primarily Buddhist scriptures, have been found at this site. Uh, actually, uh, Professor Wang has done excellent work and written a book on uh, studying some of these manuscripts together with visual materials to explore uh, esoteric Buddhism in medieval China. Uh, my focus here is on medical manuscripts. We do find about uh, 100 manuscripts uh, of, you know, about healing, about medicine, and many of which are fragmented, but still very valuable. And uh, these manuscripts actually not just preserve the Tang features of medical practice without later Song editorial magnification, but also reflect some kind of local features of medical practice at a time, right, in Dunhua. This is one example uh, showing, uh, uh, this is a fragment of a material medical text called newly revised material medical, which I'll come back in a minute. And this entry is on gelsemium, uh, which is uh, called Gowen in Chinese a highly poisonous herb growing in Southern China. Uh, you can see again, a layers of copying here, starting from the text in red, that's from the Divine Farmer's Classic. And then you have the uh, small characters with commentaries. Uh, the first commentary there is from uh, the fifth century. And then another layer of commentary from the Tang editions, uh, right? So um, again, showing this layer of writing Okay, so with that uh, background introduction, now I'd like to uh, give you a brief outline of my talk in the following, let's say, you know, 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, uh, two dimensions, one is about the state production of medical knowledge, and the second dimension is about local transformations. And starting from the first point, um, the town state, especially in the seventh century, uh, established a series of medical institutions at the central government, and some of which also uh, 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 or, or, or continued uh, in local regions. And one institution uh, I want to highlight is called Palace Drug Service. It's called Shang Yao Ju. Basically, uh, it's an institution uh, providing medical service for imperial house. It can be divided into five different departments. 
including general medicine, therapeutic exercise, uh, incantation, interest me there, uh, cream making, and finally drug preparation. And I want to direct your attention to the last part, which is uh, which concerns more about pharmacology here. And among all the personnel in this service, about 84, half of them, 42 actually, were involved in this large, large, last department uh, preparation of drugs, which involved the pounding, soaking, cutting of various drug ingredients, uh, making to uh, uh, readily use medicine for the imperial house. And you may ask, right, where did people at the time get the ingredients? Uh, as we can see from the material medical writings, oftentimes they specify the source's location for each drug, indicating it's very important that to identify and collect the drug from a regional site uh, because of the soil, because of the climate there, right? So oftentimes it's hard to transplant those medicines over long distance. So for this purpose, actually the town state uh, created a local drug tribute system called Tugum uh, uh, in Chinese collecting medicines, collecting ingredients from all over uh, its empire. Uh, this is based on the early 9th century record offering an extensive list of items, including medicines, tribute items to the imperial house. You can see here, uh, the, this, this, this various dots uh, shows uh, the prefectures uh, which presented medicines to, uh, as a tribute to the, to the, to the central government. The open circle uh, shows the pot uh, non-potent drugs, and then the solid circle showed uh, the, so uh, the potent drugs. And I don't have time to cover everything here, but one thing I find, uh, a couple of things I find interesting is that you can see, that, for example, on the region of C here, a concentration of uh, prefectures presenting drugs to uh, the central court. Uh, this is in the modern day Sichuan area with high mountain ridges, eastern side of Tibetan Plateau, and moist climate, which are favorable for the growing of variety of herbs in our region. In the case of potent substances, uh, we find a more concentrated you know, uh, collection from the central and southern region, for example, Python, Python skull bladders are primarily collected from the far south in the Guangzhou area, uh, are presented to the court. So, Besides this tribute system, the Tang government also uh, established the legal regulation of poisons. This is based on the reading of some passages from the Tang Code, the first complete extant legal document in China. And one section titled the use of poisons to poison people, it's quite revealing. So in this section, it says those who use poisons to poison people uh, are, uh, and, and, who sell, and those who sell these poisons will be hanged, right? So that's very severe punishment uh, uh, for, for such uh, usage. But the author also added an interesting note below, that is these substances can kill people, although they are indeed poisoned, they can also cure illness. If the buyer intends to poison pers a person, but the seller doesn't know it, the intention, the seller is not punished. So that my point here is that the intentionality mattered. If the, you know, the seller colluded with the buyer, and surely that person will be persecuted. But if that person didn't know the intention, and used selling the substance for a legitimate purpose, in this case for killing illness, then that person will not be punished, right? So it was not the substance itself, but the, its intended use that actually mattered in this legal document. Besides setting up legal codes, uh, Tang Court also produced medical texts. Um, and one important text it uh, produced is called newly revised Material Medica, Qin Xiu Ban Cao, completed in the middle of the 7th century. So this is uh, first, the first um, government commissioned pharmacological text in Chinese history. And it significantly expanded the earlier pharmacological writing, uh, including uh, 54 scrolls, uh, including text, illustration of drugs, and map of the drugs uh, throughout the empire. Unfortunately, the second, the third sections are lost. We only have the text now. Um, 
We, uh, the, it, it includes 850 drugs altogether, which are grouped into categories by natural properties, such as minerals, herbs, trees, beasts and birds, reptiles and fish, vegetables, fruits, and greens. The last three belong to the food category, actually. So this is a uh, 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 analysis of distribution of drugs in uh, this government-sponsored uh, pharmacopoeia. You can see that uh, the green bar uh, shows all, all medicines uh, divided by different categories, and the red bar uh, points, out, uh, points to the potent, uh, potent medicine, uh, do possessing medicines. Uh, a subset of them. So altogether, about 20% of all medicine are considered do possessing, the potent. And you can see a large portion of that is in herbs. But proportionally speaking, you can see the reptiles and fish has about 40% of potent medicine, very high percentage there. But you can take, if you take a look at the, the right side, the fruits, vegetables, and grains, you can see um, they, 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 they don't contain that many potent drugs, and which is understandable because these food uh, substances are to be consumed regularly for uh, nourishing the body. So too potent the substance will not serve that purpose, right? So the question here is that why did the Tang government issue a new uh, material medical text? And so we can get a clue from the preface of this, uh, from this book written by a high official. So this person, Kong Zhiyue, he was not a medical you know, practitioner. He was a high official. He was the director of the Ministry of the Right. And that uh, he wrote a preface, which is very much a celebration of the grandiose power of the Tang Empire. And um, there's a recently released the Dunhuang manuscript from Japan that preserve a Tang section of the preface, which is missing in the Song edition, for the reason you'll see in a minute. And scholars uh, such as Iwamoto Atsushi has done excellent work reconstructing and analyzing this preface, which my own research is building upon. And for this passage, uh, it's fragmented, uh, but give us a clue of the agenda of the Tang court uh, in making this new pharmacological text. It goes, our great Tang rules under heaven. We have inherited the propitious fortune of the Qin and Han, and during the devastating time of the Zhou and Sui, that's the following dynasties, uh, we say, uh, 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 can you see the word here, the, something of the heaven from falling and stabilize the center to prevent it from toppling. We have recalibrated all kinds of things to continue nourishing humans. Our magnificent achievements reverberate uh, and our orderly rule spread throughout the word, a world. So, um, so you can see the whole text. I couldn't see the right side of the text for some reason, but that's fine. Um, so basically this depicts a grandiose image of the Tang Empire uh, through its effort of recovering and sustaining the proper order of the cosmos you know, after the collapse of the chaos of the preceding dynasties. Tang see themselves as a power, a, a new power with the effort of this word recalibrating actually is quite interesting here. Uh, in Chinese, this is called chunggo, right? With the effort recalibrating everything in the, in the cosmos. Assuring including medicines, that's part of the uh, agenda. And so as an effort to standardize all things in the world in order to achieve or strive for uh, an effective ruling. Right, so you can see this symbolic meaning of using medicines as a way to manifest the grandiose power of the Tang Empire is very much uh, manifest in such passage. So with that effort, I want to um, go to uh, the second part of my talk on the local transformations here, right? The state on the one hand have this gesture and effort to producing medical knowledge, how it was received in local regions, and again, here, I want to focus on some uh, Dunhuang manuscripts. Um, and one particular uh, uh, actually attract my attention. There are altogether five different manuscripts of newly revised Material Medica uh, in Dunhuang, some of which I already shown you before. And this one actually is quite unique in terms of its form. Uh, it's written on a small pen leaflet about, um, this is about, 10 inches long, three inches wide, written on both sides. 
uh, relatively small characters. And, and we know that um, the last line, this is the last line on the back, was written, like a squeezed in. So it's a complete sentence of that drug entry. So altogether, eight different medicines are included on uh, this uh, leaflet, one on the front, seven on the back. And you can also see that uh, there's a hole there actually uh, at upper center of the manuscript. And uh, so which one can, we can imagine you use a string to tie multiple pieces of that, of this manuscript together, right? So, and this is typical of a particular type of manuscript called, um, let me see, called Poti, called Poti manuscript. And we find about 100 such uh, Poti manuscripts from the Dunhuang collection. And this manuscript form actually, uh, it didn't derive from Dunhuang, actually it came from uh, Southern Indian from ancient time. Oftentimes you see a, uh, a collection of such leaflets tied together by strings and covered by wood, uh, wooden cover and sometimes wrapped in cloth. Right? So uh, originally it was written on the dried palm leaves the material available in Indian. Uh, and so from Indian, it uh, transmitted this form of writing transmitted to the Central Asia and from Central Asia to Tibet. And during this process, sometime in the fifth century of, of the common era, uh, paper started to be used to replace the palm leaves as the main uh, medium to write uh, this type of manuscript. And the majority of manuscripts we find today actually are Buddhist scriptures, uh, perhaps not surprising. And from the Tibetan Empire, uh, eventually uh, it landed uh, in, uh, at the site of Dunhuang. And here it's, I need to point out that, you know, the Tibetan Empire occupied the Dunhuang from the second half of the eighth century to the, uh, to the early ninth century. So the Tang power was pushed to the east. So, and under that influence, uh, it's conceivable that this type of pothi manuscripts uh, got imported uh, and uh, preserved in the Dunhuang collection. So, coming back to uh, more about the writing on the manuscript, uh, the writing actually is very unique in comparison to the more conventional writing as I showed you before. Uh, this is a different uh, Dunhuang manuscript that more follows the rule, the convention of copying different layers of text by different sizes or different colors of the text, right? But on the left is this small uh, leaflet. You can see there's no differentiation, differentiation of the size of the character, nor is there any differentiation of the color, right? So every character was written with the same size, same color, uh, which is, a, uh, in a sense, it's, it's a breaking the textual hierarchy established in the conventional writing. And what's more, we can find interesting selective copying here. On the front side, we see a complete copying of a single item called scallion, including its various medical usages, including its three varieties uh, of the plant with different purposes. But on the back, we see quite uh, severe selective copying. You can see that seven drugs were squeezed onto one side of it. You can see how much text was cut off. Uh, seven drugs, I mean, names of here are not so important, uh, but I just pointed out here for you. And some of this copying actually is so uh, severe that the original divine farmer's classic text uh, is gone, actually, it's completely gone there. So the question here is uh, why there is such a selective copying and there are. Uh, different scenarios. And one uh, postulation I offer is that to think about the practical usage of uh, each of these substances included on the manuscript, the scallion on the front, actually is a rather versatile medicine. Uh, it can, for example, its seeds can brighten the eyes and replenish the body. It stands that treat cold damage conditions excessive sweating and swollen face, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long passage here describing the diverse medical usages. And also further uh, specifies three different kinds of uh, scallion can be used for different uh, purposes. Right? So it's almost like marvelous panacea. Uh, and also this 
medicine is locally grown. It's basically you can find it everywhere and surely you can find it in a local region. By comparison, the other drugs on the backside, uh, many of which are not so locally available, giving two, exa two examples, vertebrate and not wheat uh, here, that these two drugs actually, they, uh, are, they were grown in the faraway regions from Dunhuang. One is uh, in uh, Jiuzhen, that's in the modern northern Yan'an region. And the second one, not wheat, actually came from uh, the Hezi region, that's in uh, the Shandong Peninsula in the Far East, both far away from, uh, from the sites of Dunhuang. And also they tend to grow along the rivers and uh, lakes, uh, wet environment, uh, and Dunhuang, uh, it's a very dry region. So given these considerations, it's perhaps not surprising that these medicines uh, were subject to most severe cutting on the back, possibly for uh, practical reasons. Who may have produced and used the lifted, right? So there's no direct evidence or information written on the manuscript. And so we can only sort of postulate the, the possible persons involved, possibly local monks in Dunhuang. And given a little bit, uh, uh, you know, historical background here, as I mentioned before, the Tang State did, you know, established institutions both at the center and at local prefectures uh, to promote medicine to, uh, and medical learning. And this included Dunhuang, actually called Shazhou uh, in Tang records. But after Tibetan uh, power uh, pushed the Tang to the east and occupied Dunhuang, the Tang influence became uh, uh, weakened. And then the local monasteries actually became the major actors offering healing practices, healing service for the local people. Um, so previous scholars have examined a few uh, prominent Buddhist monks actually very active in local region providing healing service and gain high reputations. So it's possible that some of these monks may use pharmacological text in this form that's easy to carry and easy to identify itemized, uh, you know, for, for such an itemized text, identify each item of drugs, right? So by flipping through the potent manuscripts. So that's uh, that's that's the possibility I offer here. It's also interesting that in uh, Chinese Buddhism, uh, according to certain Buddhist scriptures, it defined five pungent foods as forbidden, called wuxin here, which includes large garlic, small garlic, as a fetida, Chinese onion, and last one is scallion, as we just encountered in the manuscript. So these foods actually are forbidden by Buddhist doctrine because their pungent flavor impedes uh, the purification of the mind, so it disturbs the mind. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the reason. But we do find that scallion actually was included on this manuscript, possibly used by Buddhist monks. So here my point is that it's not just um, the medicine itself, but it's the intent to use for medicine pur medical purpose that mattered, right? There's no absolute rule that certain things cannot be used in this context of uh, Buddhist practice. Finally, I want to say a few words on the drug substitution. Another strategy local actors is developed to, uh, to cope with the existing condition. And coming back to the example of Jiaoximin, this highly poisonous herb growing in Southern China, uh, this is actually a real physical example, uh, sample of the Jiaoximin roots preserved in Shoso in repository uh, in Todaiji uh, Temple in Nala, dating to the 8th century. And this is preserved, uh, donated by the Imperial House of Japan to the temple. And they probably acquired medicine from China because this is locally grown in southern China. And Jiaoximin was highly poisonous, but despite this this highly toxicity, and I would argue because of that, some of the physicians in China actually prescribe it for medical usage, primarily external usage. Uh, in the case of Sun Simiao, for example, he prescribed one medicine in his former collection called ointment of Jiaoximian, uh, which used Jiaoximian as a key ingredient to make this ointment that can treat poison swelling pain and numbness in the limbs, ulcers, weak feet, 
among other conditions. So according to him, it was very effective. But toward the end of that formula, he offer, offers a warning. This formula should not be uh, used to, uh, by the, to, to lay people, be cautious, right? So this is interesting warning here. Uh, and he offers this warning probably because of this, this, this drug is highly poisonous. So he was afraid that this substance can fall into the wrong hands in lay people or by mil, uh, mispractice, malpractice. And so, and, and so that it's, it's basically forbidden. And we have some evidence by the Tang government that this substance was not allowed to be used by private families uh, as stipulated by certain Tang code. So how did people in Dunhuang cope with this situation? So this is another medical manuscript from Dunhuang using, uh, supposedly using just yimian as its key ingredient to make uh, ointment. Uh, that's, the, that's the formula. And whoever uh, copied this uh, manuscript actually added an interesting note here underneath uh, the uh, one particular ingredient. And that goes, the original farmer uses just yimian, called yegu here, and nowadays it cannot be obtained. So one uses uh, photolaca uh, to replace it. So photolaca is also a dual possessing substance. So this is not a, a situation when a person use a less toxic drug to treat illness. Actually, uh, it is also uh, very potent. Uh, the point here is that Danglu, the photolaca, it carries similar medical values as gelsinium. And also very importantly, it was locally available. It was not forbidden by physicians or government. So it was easier to get access to. And so it became a suitable substitute for just seeing for local actors. So to wrap up uh, this talk, um, so I uh, offered some example of the state regulation of medicine early time, including the building of medical institutions, uh, including the creation of legal codes, as well as the standardization of material medica texts. And I want to put this in the broader context of the Tang and Song, uh, this transition. We see in the early Tang, the state played a very important role in promoting medicine. Uh, in the late Tang, that, would, that, that ceased to be the case uh, with, you know, after the Andushan Rebellion, the weakening of the central government, there was no such grandiose project of promoting medicine or pharmacological test, no such effort was made. And then from the Song period, period time, especially Northern Song, we witnessed a resumed effort by the Song government to uh, uh, produce new medical texts, regulate medical practice, and facilitated in particular by the rise of printing. So scholars such as T.J. Hinrichs, Asaf Goldschmidt, and Fan Jiawei all have written uh, important works on this important moment in Chinese medical history. But in the pre-Song period of time when the manuscript culture flourished, right, in its various forms and different contents, the situation is different. Of course, we do have printing there, but it's very nascent, not primarily used to medicine, mainly for religious texts. So when the manuscript culture flourished, we see this adaptive and fluid nature of writing allows the local actors, including those in Dunhuang, resourcefully cope with the existing established medical canons and modify these canons both in form and in content uh, according to the availability of ingredients, according to the needs of local actors. So when manuscript culture flourished, the power of the textual regime was limited, leading to the rich varieties of local writings that guided, uh, that defied you know, established conventions and guided medical practices. So thank you so much. Uh, that's the end of my talk. And I um, am looking forward to uh, the discussion. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Liu, for your rich talk. And now moving on to the Q&A portion of today's event. Um, so if you have a question for Professor Liu, can I please ask you to use the little digital hand, if you could raise your little digital hand, or feel free to put your questions in the chat and I'll read them out loud to him. Okay, 
Well, while we're waiting for questions to bubble up from the audience, perhaps I could start off with one question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the state regulation of medical knowledge, um, uh, particularly between um, Central Plains China um, and Dunhuang. So uh, do you sense, for example, that um, medical knowledge is being um, regulated evenly um, between Central China, um, the Central Court, and Dunhuang? Or are you noticing differences, for example, between received texts and the manuscripts? Thank you, Professor Wang, for that question. So this is a question about uh, the regulatory medicine, I mean, the difference, potential difference between the central government and local, uh, local regions. And so uh, this talk, uh, because of the time limit, I only focus on the, the central government there, uh, all the institutions, legal codes, uh, and um, uh, the text produced at the center. Um, so for uh, the institutional building, there are uh, local, you know, repercussions of that, uh, not as extensive because uh, the particular service, um, uh, the imperial drug service, Shangyaoju actually that's served for the imperial house. So surely that doesn't really have a local, you know, counterpart, but there's a different medical institution called imperial medical service that's primarily for uh, providing service for the government officials and also for medical education, it does have local uh, counterparts, uh, including the region in Dunhuang called Shazhou there. So, um, and we do have uh, some uh, Dunhuang manuscript reflecting that effort of training local personnel to provide service to local officers. So that's, you know, different from providing, you know, service to, for example, local monks or local people. This is still very high in the the society in terms of such uh, institutional setup. Uh, the legal documents, I think it has a more uh, repercussions throughout the society, definitely going beyond the capital of the town uh, in terms of the use of poisons, in terms of prohibitions, is pretty much supposedly throughout the empire, uh, including the local regions where we do find certain poisons were not available because of such uh, stipu uh, stipulation. So, and that's basically, you know, um, the, yeah, what, what can see uh, here. Uh, the Dunhuang manuscript actually provide a different angle because many of which were not produced by the government or even local government, right? Produced by individuals, by the monks or by unknown figures. So this is one effort we try to get from a more a, a lay person's perspective, how they can, they can, they can cope with the, you know, the, the situations and come up with something that can be useful for them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great, thank you. And again, I'd like to invite the audience members to um, ask questions either by putting them in the chat or by raising their digital hands. So I have, I'm sorry, Professor um, Yanlio, I came late because I was teaching. So I missed a great part of your talk, which I'm very, very sad about. But um, could I ask you about your project on aromatics and you know how you're conceptualizing that and um, the Silk Road, the relationship to the Silk Road? Uh, sure, so uh, that's, um, uh, that's basically the, the, uh, my, my second project. Um, so uh, I started from my first project on poisons because um, as I briefly mentioned uh, in this talk, there is uh, expansion of drugs over time uh, in material medical literature. And many of these new drugs actually get imported from other places, uh, sometimes distant places beyond you know, the Tang Empire. So, and when I, was working on this project, I was very interested in, you know, whether any kind of uh, poisons from other places important China and being used. Uh, I didn't find that many, uh, and there is a reason for that. I, I, I won't spend time on here, but I did find a lot of antidotes, uh, particular uh, aromatics used as antidotes um, to counter poisons, right? So that's the starting point of this second project on aromatics uh, in a sense is, very much like yin and yang, yin is poison, yang is aromatics. Um, uh, 
uh, pairing. And so many of these aromatics came from um, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and I did a particular, uh, some in-depth research on saffron, uh, the transculture history of saffron, imported from um, Kashmir region and Central Asia to China from fifth, sixth century on and became uh, to be used not just as a medicine, as antidote, but also as a religious object, uh, making incense, very important in Buddhist rituals. This, I think Professor Wang may have some thoughts on a certain esoteric rituals uh, in the town, uh, very prominent there, and also uh, to lesser degree food uh, cuisine because spice and aromatics overlap uh, quite a lot. So this project is basically a project to explore uh, substances like saffron uh, and working on camphor and, and frankincense as well. So how uh, the actors who uh, are involved in uh, importing them into China and the diverse uh, usages uh, in, uh, in Chinese medicine, in Chinese culinary culture, um, in Chinese religious culture. Um, and also speaking of the history of smell, that's another, another thing I find quite interesting because many of these aromatic emit strong smells uh, which induce a new bodily experiences uh, among physicians and religious practitioners in China. And uh, I want to explore how such new sensations inform the production of new medical knowledge and religious experiences in China uh, during this period of time. Yeah, so that's Thank a you. very brief uh, yeah. summary of that project. And Thank you. Again, I'm sorry I wasn't here for the whole talk. But yeah. I, it's being recorded, right, Michelle? So. Yeah, yeah, it is. Absolutely. And you are being recorded, Carol, actually. So okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so we have two questions that came from the chat. Let me read the first one by Michael Denman. And since you mentioned Yin Yang, this is a perfect segue to that question. He asked, were there uh, was there religious influence on the activities of the palace drug service, particularly Taoist? That's a great question because I was thinking um specifically of the of the um Buddhist influence, but here he's asking about the Taoist influence. Okay, so let me see the text chat. So uh, Taoist influence on, on what? Um, on which part? Uh, it's on poison? Uh, on the activities of the um, palace drug service. Oh, okay. That, um, uh, there, there is um, one connection I can see that is not directly connected to the poison, but it's definitely connected to uh, the Taoism. One of the five branches there actually is incantation. Um, so, and that's, you know, actually the text itself acknowledges that um, the central government tongue use this way of healing, healing by word, spoken words, incantation, as influenced by both Buddhist and Taoist uh, practices. And then it specified, uh, you know, further, you know, a different uh, ritual, uh, like, you know, pace of yu, this kind of method of walking, uh, like the talisman using, using talisman uh, as part of the incantation to, um, uh, to treat illnesses. So definitely there is um, an influence there. And we know that the, the healing by incantation can be traced back to earlier time, for sure in the Han and Euro division. And scholars, including Taoist uh, scholars have done extensive work on that. But this moment in early Tang is interesting because this is when such, uh, practice became acknowledged uh, at a higher level, actually at the highest level of the government and incorporated it into its healing repertoire. And that was unprecedented uh, before. And so, uh, and that's, that's and, and the primary function of using incantation is to combat epidemics actually. So uh, oftentimes through so this ritual performance uh, orchestrated by the state effort to fight epidemic diseases. So that's something uh, I also find quite quite interesting. Yeah. Thank you. We have three more questions in the chat. So let me draw your attention to the question by Lakshmi Krishnan. And she thanks you for a phenomenal talk. And she'd like to ask what this project has revealed about the medical uh, legal apparatus during both dynasties, um, Tang Song, and during the transitional period in particular, and what role medical experts played in the titration of potent substances um, that is dictating whether um, substances were therapeutic or poisonous? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, uh, uh, Dr. Krishnan. And that actually speaks to uh, the core of uh, the argument of my book, right? So because there is this ambivalence between 
medicines and poisons, how did people at the time actually you know, figure out the right way to do it? And there's the effort from the state through legal documents, legal regulation. There's the effort by the physicians. They actually so wrote, for example, the physician I uh, studied in detail uh, in another, another chapter of my book, Sun Simiao, as introduced in his talk. He, he actually um, wrote formula books that incorporated uh, medical cases uh, in his study, actually the first uh, uh, in Chinese history incorporating medical cases in the writing of recipes. And he often used his personal experience as um, a, 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 a way to testify uh, the efficacy of medicines, including potent medicines such as Josemian, as I mentioned uh, before in my talk. So that's one, you know, effort by these capable physicians to try to produce authoritative text through their personal experience to make that knowledge you know, convincing, right? That's also the part of elevating their own reputation at the time. Um, so speaking of this transition, right? This is a really good point that, you know, uh, even if this is something beyond my, my own focus, I, my book pretty much stopped at eighth century, but I do, find some interesting changes in terms of who are more involved in the producing uh, and promoting such knowledge, including the knowledge of poisons, that, as I mentioned, the state became more uh, weakened after uh, the 8th century. And so the scholar officials um, became a more uh, of a group, an important group of actors. And these officials are not trained practitioners of medicine but they are often very interested in learning medicine uh, for their personal interest, for their scholarly interest, and they often uh, exchange ideas through their network. Uh, again, using, for example, uh, uh, good medical texts, using their personal experience to actually uh, promote the, the knowledge of using poisons. I find that uh, became more and more prominent from the eighth, ninth century, and that actually, uh, in a certain period of time, uh, became a quite, uh, important phenomenon. Uh, this is building upon, for example, uh, scholar Chen Yunru's work on how scholars, uh, officials, and they use such kind of empirical knowledge to advance their learning of poisons. Um, so that's something I, I find is quite interesting. So thank you for your question. We have two more questions and they're somewhat related. So I was hoping to combine them um, so that um, after we respond, we can move on to the informal meet and greet part of the program. Um, so Minji Lee, thanks you for your great talk. And she would like to ask whether um, certain poisons were described to have a nature of heat or coldness and whether those natures contributed to the, to the efficacy of the poisons. Mm -hmm. And then Emily Baum asks, um, if there was any notion similar to the law of similars that um, whether a particular drug or poison could induce the same symptoms that it could counteract. Yeah, yeah, those are excellent questions. Thank you for both your questions. So uh, I think in chapter six of my book, I particular uh, talk about uh, uh, the, the connection between poison and heat. Uh, so because for each drug entry in Chinese pharmacy, you have the drug properties, cold and hot. And Many of the highly poisonous herbs and minerals are defined as uh, with heating power. Um, like, you know, one popular drug called cold food powder or firestone powder, uh, which, which involves the use of arsenic and other minerals. Uh, it can, you know, trigger tremendous heat inside the body. Um, actually, that's not something to be avoided. That's actually something as a heating process. And the key point there, according to the discussion at the time is how to channel that heat properly out of the body uh, to achieve heating. Uh, oftentimes that was not done properly and a lot of tragedy, tra tragedy uh, ensued. And so uh, it's a very controversial drug because of that. Um, speaking of the, uh, the, the question, uh, uh, Professor Baum, your questions about uh, the similar, right? Using similar to counter similar. Uh, in Chinese, there is a term called yidu gong du. You probably heard that term, yidu gong du, using poison to attack poison. And actually, that's the title of uh, another chapter uh, in my book. I really try to explore the rationale of why people at the time use a lot of poison. And so these ideas of using a powerful substance to treat 
uh, hard to treat illness actually is uh, at the core of uh, the Russian medical rationale. That uh, in, in addition, uh, I argue that these diseases treated by poison are often perceived uh, of uh, possessing a concrete form, be it in the form of demon or in the form of worm uh, or insects. And so a powerful poison can strike them. Right? That's the word they use, strike, gong. Uh, to uh, eliminate these uh, uh, malicious entities out of the body. And, and I also actually find an interesting parallel between that, uh, uh, the, the, the medical rationale of using poison to counter poison and the political uh, uh, environment in the Sui and Tang, especially early Tang, when the state um, implemented stringent policies, just like using poisons, to uh, marginalize and eliminate a problematic group of people. In this case, I'm talking about the Gu poisoning, the witchcraft uh, of Gu, uh, and which create a lot of anxiety in society. So the parallel here I find is interesting is that, you know, uh, just like the use of poison to treat uh, 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 this, this very difficult diseases, the government also implements stringent policies to eliminate uh, certain social groups to clean uh, the political body. Right? So thank you very much for that question. Um, with that, I'd like to invite everyone to um, join me in thanking Professor Leo for his talk. I'm giving him a round of his applause and also congratulating him on the recent publication of his book. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for everyone. Yeah, uh, it's great uh, to have you here and discussing my book. Uh, and yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity.